for the day. Uh, Carol Ann Borker has been the coordinator for serials at the University of South Florida since 2004. Previously, she was in the Reference and Government Documents Department at USF in several areas of the James B. Duke Library at Furman University. She holds an MLS from the University of Kentucky and an MA in Spanish from USF. Julie Fielding has been a Library Operations Coordinator at the University of South Florida since August 2011, working with electronic resources and open access journals. Before this, she was an Information Services Associate at Gale Cengage Learning. She holds an MLIS from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And now, without any further ado, I will turn things over to Carol Ann. Things open that I need to be able to see now that I've got control of this and then get them out of my way. Um, I noticed that one person was asking about being able to see or hear anything yet. Todd, I can't send a response to her. You may want to take a look at the Q&A section. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to first talk a little bit about the University of South Florida Tampa Library. Some background on us. Our university was founded in 1956. So we are a fairly new university. We are a high-impact global research university in an urban setting. Um, we have, because our collections are so new, we don't have the depth of a collection, say, that a university that's been around for a century or two would have, so in terms of our print. So when the electronic collections started to become available, we jumped on that bandwagon pretty quickly. Um, we do have over 40,000 headcount of students but we only have about 30,000 FTE. So we are, um, we do have a lot of students who are non-traditional or part-time students. The library does have ARL aspirations and initiatives, although we are not an ARL library at this time. And our institutional repository is part of this um, initiative, trying to, to work up to becoming if not an actual ARL library, something comparable to an ARL library. Our organizational structure, we do have a dean of the USF libraries. The USF libraries includes the Tampa Library, which you see pictured here, the Health Sciences Library, and then there are libraries in Sarasota and St. Petersburg as well. There are three directors in the Tampa Library. One is the Director of Academic Resources, which covers technical services and the Institutional Repository Initiative. Um, it also includes our GIS initiatives. There is a director over academic services, which is mostly public services functions in the library loan circulation reference. And there's a director of human resources. Now, we previously had a director for special collections and digitization. After he left, his duties were distributed so that special collections now falls under academic services, and digitization went to human resources because that director happens to have experience in that area in the previous position. And this is kind of when someone leaves, we are not, we're still on a hiring freeze. We have been for a few years. So we kind of redistribute work and, and train as we need to. Um, looking at our peer and aspirant institutions, you've got USF listed up here at the top with our numbers in red. And you can see that we're a little bit behind in terms of staffing and materials budget from what we are considering our peer institutions. We have, over the last few years, had a lot of retirements. We've had some attrition with people leaving and going other places. As I said, we've been on a hiring freeze. So we've been kind of... Um, refocusing our staff skills and trying to make our workflows as efficient as possible in the midst of this. Um, we have not had any layoffs, thank goodness. And these peers were selected at the university level. They are similar institutions in various ways to ours. Um, for example, Rutgers is a publicly funded large urban university like University of South Florida. University of Cincinnati has a similar organizational model to ours. Um, we wouldn't necessarily compare our library to these institutions' libraries, but since the university is choosing this model, we did so to be consistent. It's similar institutional goals. So what got us down the path of starting an institutional repository and open access journal publishing? Um, well, from the dean's point of view, 
he was trying to enhance the importance of the library on campus, sort of to, to increase the footprint uh, on campus of the library's contribution. Um, we did select vPress as our open access journals platform. Um, this was when they had the etiquette system. It was before their digital commons full institutional repository was available. So this was started as an open access journal initiative specifically. Um, the IT support from vPress was a key factor in selecting them over some other options. We didn't have the staff to handle the administrative setup and design that would have been required with some of the other systems. Um, so we did look at three other systems besides vPress, but we were philosophically committed to looking for hosted solutions because of our staffing situation. In our specific case, it was just easier to fund the initiative than to staff it with the retirements and attrition and the hiring freeze that we were encountering. On the director's side, he was looking at cost increases in serials. You know, could libraries maybe just pay to publish this stuff ourselves? His reasoning was that the university pays the faculty to do the research, the faculty write the articles, edit the journal, do the peer review, they give it to the publishers to publish, and then the university and libraries buy it back after that investment has already come from our side. So the publishers sell us more and more content, our patrons want more and more content, kind of becomes sort of an addictive cycle. I'm sure all of you have experienced that. Um, we also um, had existing relationships with faculty, particularly in the geology department. And um, some of those were through the Karst Information Portal. We were one of the founding um, institutions to get the Karst Information Portal started. Other institutions included the National Cave and Karst Research Institute, the University of New Mexico, and the um, Italian International Union of Speleology, which I'm not even going to try and say that in Italian. Um, but we did, this was our first, during the, when we were working with the Karst Information Portal, it was our first foray into open access publishing with the publication of a open access monograph, Cave Minerals of San Salvador Island in the Bahamas, which was made available through the Karst Portal. So in 2009, we brought Digital Commons online, but the repository stagnated for about a year until responsibility for that moved from another department into academic resources. Other factors that were um, involved in getting us working on an institutional repository, we had very disjointed digital collections. Um, we were using a variety of tools to manage digital collections, including OCLC Site Search, Luna Insight, Content DM, Digital, Fedora, Drupal, and as mentioned earlier, the BPress Journals etiquette platform. Now, we weren't using all of these at one time, some of this was over a period of time that we were using these, but it created some difficulty in managing our metadata. We did not have any cohesive taxonomy. We had sometimes students were assigning things. We had words misspelled. So we had to clean up our metadata as part of this, this process. We also had electronic theses and dissertations going back to 2003, but they had very poor visibility where they were housed at that time. Google does not crawl the ETDs that were in our catalog, and we also had some buried in Coral, which was not compliant with most of the user market. Coral is a, a system that combines open source products like Fedora plus some of our own homegrown components to manage our digital collections. Uh, Numeracy was our first open access journal. It was born digital in December 2007, so this is a journal that has been online the whole time. It did not come to us from another format or another website. And um, at the end of 2010, we started hosting journals on Scholar Commons, but Numeracy and another journal, Studia Geologia, were hosted on that original etiquette system. So getting numeracy on board, this is kind of an interesting little story. Um, our academic resources director, Todd Chavez, had co-taught a class with Dr. Len Vasher in the geology department, here's our geology connection, on characteristics of geologic information. Now, um, Vasher is a member of the National Numeracy Network, and he had explained to Todd that there was this hole in the literature for quantitative literacy. There's no interdisciplinary journal for what's really a highly interdisciplinary field. Um, this is, they're sort of math-related topics, but it's math as it pertains to financial literacy or, or other types of financial behavior. 
So it didn't really fit into math journals, the kinds of things that they would be writing. The National Numeracy Network did not have a society journal. So um, NNN had a three-day meeting, and they really sat and talked and strategized on how they could make a contribution to the literature. And in the meantime, um, our academic resources director had been talking with Dr. Vasher to convince him to start an open access online only journal and why that would benefit him, his authors, and his readers. So people in this field tend not to write much, but Vasher felt that they had something important to say. So it was kind of a kinder, gentler approach to get these new authors to write um, articles for a publication than what they might have gotten from a commercial publisher where there was a concern about the bottom line. So it has a pretty high level of peer review and lots of editor comments. Dr. Vasher uses those editor comments as a, as a feedback and a teaching moment for authors. He gives very detailed feedback on what can be done better about it, what he, what he likes about it, and so he really, you know, spends a lot of time to encourage his authors. So this is now, um, as of about two years ago, I think, it's being indexed by EBSCOhost databases. So this journal is getting noticed. The universities, the university and the libraries in particular have a commitment to open access. Um, we're committed to improving access to quality scholar, scholarly information. Um, this complements our existing digital collections and resources, um, and as I'll explain that in a few more minutes, that you know, how we started bringing those digi collections over into the repository and consolidating them into one place and one tool and cleaning up that metadata. It also ensures the availability of the intellectual property produced by USF to our own constituents and to the larger academic community. So once we produce the material, it's ours, we own it, we're publishing it. We don't have to buy it back. There are several benefits to editors and authors. The content is online and freely available with a professional design on USF Scholar Commons. Um, B Press has had really good designers working with these web pages, so that's we're very pleased with what we've gotten there. The journal's visibility increases as appearance in search results is enhanced, and that's um, due to the, the way that B Press has their system structured. And Digital Commons Platform is a professional publishing and peer review tool designed to facilitate editorial workflow. So editors are not having to manage documents by email, trying to keep track of which one is the most current document. That's all kept in a central system where all of the versions are there. You've got the reviewer comments in there, emails to the reviewers and the authors go from the system. So everything is in a central place. Um, content for these journals is included in locks for archiving. We notify locks that a title is available, and then B Press takes care of the feeds for us. And statistical usage is sent to the editors and authors each month from B Press. For most of our journals, the authors retain rights under a Creative Commons license, so they get to keep ownership of their material instead of handing it over to a publisher. Okay, so now that we're publishing open access journals, and as Digital Commons became available from B Press, called Scholar Commons at USF from our end, uh, we decided to put everything together into one institutional repository system. So as I said, we chose DC as our, as our platform. We worked with B Press to have them batch load information into the system. They transferred 2,954 electronic theses and dissertations from 2003 to 2010 into the institutional repository. They also set up selected works pages for faculty from selected departments. Um, these departments included anthropology, biology, geology, the School of Information, and the College of Marine Science each of whom had faculty with whom the, the library had strong connections, such as through the Karst Information Portal. We also had a Gulf Oil Spill Information Center from the 2010 Gulf Oil Spill. Um, so this created a showcase to kind of woo new faculty into contrib contributing content to the repository. So B Press helped find low-hanging fruit to get faculty publications into the system using Web of Science as a starting point and got a faculty page up with one or two publications for the, for the faculty that, that, that we had selected. 
and then had the faculty send a CV so that we had something more to work with. Now, we did have a little misperception with some of our faculty that they saw their selected works page go up with just one or two items, and then they thought that we were done, and that was all that they were going to get in terms of the repository. Um, so, you know, we had to explain to them that we were setting it up so that they could continue to add content, and for those of us that we had CDs for, we could do some of that ourselves. And then we upload selected digital collections. So some of the collections that were more popular, like our postcards, some Burger Brothers photos, or local history collections, we, we were able to get that up into the repository as well. We did hire two new staff members with a higher level of technical skills than what our current staff had. Um, the two staff members were hired in 2011, one of whom is Julie who you'll hear from in a, few, in a few minutes. And they were supposed to be assigned 50% to the Institutional Repository Initiative, but both of them are spending at least 75% of their time in this area. The advertised positions did not require an MLS, but we did have several candidates in the pool that had one, including our two final hires. Like I said, the existing staff had very low technical skills, so the new positions were a very big deal for us and were designed to handle the IR and e-resource responsibilities only. We did train two people to do InDesign layouts, including Julie. Uh, we previously had a person outsourced for journal layouts, but we had some quality control issues. And bringing this in-house has taken up a tremendous amount of staff time, but it's greatly improved the quality of the work and our turnaround time. Um, we had to train people to do DOI registration using XML files. I tried to learn that myself. It involved some tearing out of my hair, but we got it done and passed what I learned along to other people in the department. We also had to train folks in using the administrative side of Digital Commons. And once we had the staff hired, um, they took over the batch loading and revisions rather than paying for us paying VPress to do it for us. So they were able to help us out with that. Once we had the new staff, we could start a push for the campus outreach to encourage participation in the repository, including open access journals. We did some university-wide press releases. Um, our dean and the academic resources director attended a council of deans meeting where they did a presentation about what our repository could do for them, what it would mean for them to publish an, our, an open access journal with us. So we did get a couple of people approach us to do open access journals after that. We were able to get some additional faculty content. Some people did departmental visits. In fact, one visit to the Institute for the Study of Latin America and the Caribbean resulted in us getting the 2012 Hispanic Heritage Conference proceedings in the repository. As I mentioned earlier, we kind of capitalized on our existing faculty library relationships, and we had some events in 2012 in October for Open Access Week, and we have one of our journals came out of that particular week's events where they had a website in their department that they were trying to maintain with an open access journal and we were able to bring that into the repository to give them access to the editorial system, to give them better archiving and preservation and backup for their material, and to give them help in managing it. They were relying on a student to do a web page for them, which was a lot of staff turnover for that. We've got several types of materials in the repository, um, open access journals, faculty selected works, we've got some open access textbooks and conferences, images, the ETDs, oral histories, and data sets. The image that you see here for social science research, principles, methods, and practices, this is one of our open access textbooks. And this one, this particular one, comes from the College of Business and has had 40,233 downloads from 2011 to date. Um, so that one's getting, it's getting used pretty heavily. We've now got five OA textbooks, seven hosted conference proceedings, and the data sets that we have are linked out to other places, but they have metadata in the repository, so it increases their discoverability. And we have some lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, one of them is to work with what you have. We had the previous digital collections. We had existing library faculty relationships. We were able to work with that to get some content into our repository pretty quickly. Um, getting administrator buy-in is a must, not just in the library, but institution-wide. We have support for this initiative going all the way to the top of the university administration. And setting boundaries. You need to keep track of what is your capacity and what can you realistically do. If you over-promise and over-commit, 
you're going to disappoint your constituents and that's bad publicity for your library. It can really sabotage your, um, your initiative. So speaking of capacity, here's a list of the journals that we've got. Um, we, keep, we keep being we're told several times that this is it. We're not getting any more journals. We actually have two more in process besides these. So there's always one that sort of slides in under the wire. Numeracy, as I said, was our original journal that came up in December of 2007, um, followed probably about six months later in 2008 by Studio UBB Geologia, which also came from the geology department. Um, journal of Strategic Security focuses on homeland security. And in 2011, we brought up International Journal of Speleology. Here's another one that had connections in geology again. And um, the next two, Suburban Sustainability, Statistics and Volcanology, they came out of that. Those were the two that came out of that Council of Deans meeting. And in 2012, we've got a couple here that are from Rwanda, Journal of African Conflicts and Peace Studies and Peace and Conflict Management Review. We have a Holocaust and Genocide Studies initiative on campus. And that librarian was working closely with the people in Rwanda to bring those into the repository. Those are journals that were available in print in Rwanda. And there was very little access to that content outside of the country. So we're able to get that online now so that we can expand the accessibility to those, those topics. Revista Surcosur is a local Spanish language publication that has been brought into the repository. And we do have a native Spanish speaker on staff, so she's been managing that one for us. ABO is the one that I mentioned where that was part of our Open Access Week events. That was how that one came to us. And I'm not sure if UJMM, Undergraduate Journal of Mathematical Modeling, may have come from that same um, week of events. So here are some of the the images, the banners that we've got for some of our journals. You can see that it's quite a variety that we have. And um, I'm going to take maybe about five minutes. And if Todd wants to moderate any questions before we move on to Julie's section, which where she's going to talk about the actual workflow for managing our open access journals. Todd, do we have any questions so far? Uh, no questions uh, other than those about people not being able to hear. But I think I've gotten all those taken care of. Um, please, if you have any questions for Carol and Julie, please type them into the, uh, the Q&A window so that they can address them. But at this point, I don't see any. So I think we can move on to Julie's part of the presentation. OK, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yep, I think you're good. OK, I'll take that as a yes. OK. So here we have um, a very simplified diagram of the process we go through when we start a new open access journal. We have a submit idea, the MOU, design, training and setup, and finally launch. I'll go through each step individually and briefly discuss what's involved in each step. So the process begins with the idea phase. A faculty member will approach the library with an idea for a new journal to be hosted on Scholar Commons at USF. Sometimes it's a brand new journal, and sometimes it's an existing print journal that the editors wish to move open access. We've also had journals that were already open access, but were being hosted on a different website, and the editorial process was handled through a messy and complicated web of emails, spreadsheets, and paper, like ABO that Carol Ann mentioned. Now, while the final decision to take on a new journal rests with the Director of Academic Resources, those of us who work directly with the journals are able to offer input. The idea is evaluated, and although initially the decision was based on a journal's alignment with the library's strategic goals, lately it has hinged more on the overall strength of the idea, the commitment of the editors, and whether there is an affiliation with a professional society. Is there, I moved my microphone, can we, is it better now? I think you're a little bit less muffled. OK. Anything better? 
Okay, let's try this. Okay, so let's go on to the MOU negotiation. Once the decision is made to accept the journal, we move into step two, which is the negotiation of the memorandum of understanding. We have a standard MOU that we start off with, and it outlines the responsibilities of both parties, the USS Library and the editors of the journal. We have recently added a clause to our standard MOU stating that at least one issue will be published within 18 months of the journal's launch. The library covers the initial design fee charged by B Press for creating the journal's website. If the journal never gets off the ground, then the editors are responsible for reimbursing this fee to the library. We found that this clause also leaves out all but the most serious and committed editors. Once both parties have signed the MOU, we move into the design phase. During the design phase, library staff works in conjunction with the editors and B Press to create a design for the new journal website. Logos, colors, banner images, and the general look of the site is decided upon at this time. Editors are given a design packet to assist in this process. It asks the necessary information and cuts down a lot of the back and forth. It is essential to ask as many questions as possible about the desired design before passing the specifications over to the B-Press design team because we only get one design and two iterations of that design per our agreement with B-Press. If further changes are required, the editors will be billed directly by B-Press. Once the editors have signed off on the design, VPress will begin building a demo site, and this is the transition to the training and setup phase. Now, the demo site is a functional version of what the new actual journal site will be, but it is not publicly searchable. Only those who have the exact URL can view the demo site. After the demo site has been built, and usually before the training takes place, Library staff populates the text for the new journal site with basic HTML according to the information submitted in the design packet. This is for sections um, that will appear on the journal page, such as the About This Journal section, the Submission Guidelines section, and so forth. Then library staff again works in conjunction with the editors and B Press to schedule a training session. This session usually lasts about two hours and is usually med led by a member of the B Press team. Library staff is also present as this gives us an idea of what to expect regarding the new journals and editors' needs and how they will be using the system. Sometimes the scheduling proves a bit difficult when arranging a training session between several different time zones. We are in Florida. B Press is in California, and editors can be anywhere in the world. The training session with the editors in Rwanda, when we set up the training for the Journal of African Conflict and Peace Studies and Peace and Conflict Management Review, was especially tricky. And when we did the training for ABO, we had one member of the editorial board who was in Australia. So she was all the way on to the next day when we had our training session. Editors are then given ample time after the training session to play around with the demo site and become familiar with it. Um, this is while the actual site is being built. Library staff is available during this time to answer any questions that may come up from the editors. And it's also during this stage that uh, library staff will apply for the EISSN from the Library of Congress um, if they need one, if they don't already have one. Now, once the actual site is built, the new journal is ready to be officially launched at any time the editors so choose. We have found that launching a new journal works best when the editors have a clear plan of action for releasing their first issue. A general call for papers from an unknown journal just doesn't generate many submissions. We recommend to new editors to launch with a conference proceedings 
or a special issue perhaps with a special guest editor who is well known in their field and will garner attention. Editors can also personally request papers from colleagues. Once the journal is up and running, most of them require minimal upkeep on the part of library staff. Some of the minimal upkeep is listed here, notifying different agencies of new content, securing backup of content, troubleshooting any problems with editors, and elevating the issue to B press as needed, and writing XML files to deposit the UI with process. Usually, these don't take up much time. The special services that vary by title, this is where the time consuming issues come in. Currently, we are doing the layout design for the International Journal of Theology, which is three issues per year, Studia UBB Geologia, which is two issues per year, and the conference proceedings for the National Cave and Forest Research Institute, which is one to three issues per year. Um, other special services include um, some editors will use an alternate system for items like book reviews, and library, library staff will batch upload that content before publishing and closing an issue. Uh, when we take on a journal that has already been established in print or online, we try to obtain the back content so that we can have an entire journal catalog in one place. Library staff will batch upload this content. If it is only available in print, then we work to get it digitized. We also notify indexing services when new content is available, helping to increase the journal's discoverability. Challenges. Um, it hasn't been all sunshine and roses. We have indeed run into some challenges. When we took on the International Journal of Genealogy, we agreed to take over the printing and mailing of the issues for two years as a transition to fully open access. When I started at USF, one of my first projects was consolidating and organizing several spreadsheets of subscription information. Who's a subscriber, who gets multiple copies, who's an author, and then what issue, and then we add that to trying to format international addresses and then mailing internationally, it was quite an ordeal. Fortunately, we are no longer handling the printing of IJS or any journal, and we have no plans to ever do so again. With IJS, we also took on their layout design. Um, at the time, we did not have the staff capacity or available skill set to handle the layout design, so we contracted that service out. The workflow for that went something like this. The editors told us an article was accepted and ready to be laid out. We sent the article to the contractor. She sent us back a proof. We sent that to the editors provided we didn't first catch any glaring errors and return it back to, con to the contractor. And then the editor sent the proof to the authors who made corrections and returned it back to the editors and then the process repeats. It was rather time consuming. And it was not unusual for it to take a week to two weeks to get a single article published. We have since brought the layout design in-house. The Director of Academic Resources sent me and one of my colleagues to a training session for Adobe InDesign, and she and I have taken over all of the layouts I mentioned in the previous slide. While it is much more convenient having it in-house, it has been steadily creeping so that it is now a large part of my day, and sometimes it consumes every waking moment of my life for several weeks. For instance, I knew that the National Cave and Karst Research Institute Symposium was in the pipeline, and I had done what I could ahead of time. I prepared a template, I made sure I had all the fonts I needed, but then I received 52 articles to lay out with a hard deadline of three weeks, including edits and corrections. 
Now, to give you an idea, it usually takes me about a day or so to lay out one article. But because the conference was scheduled and the editors were planning on handing out flash drives at the conference with the proceedings loaded on them, I didn't have an option. It had to be done. By giving up my nights and weekends, I was able to complete the layout, but it was incredibly stressful, and we have alerted the editors that this absolutely cannot happen again. The demand for more services is a major challenge. At this time, with our current staffing levels, we aren't taking on any new journals, or we're doing our best not to, because we've been saying we can't handle any more for over a year but there always seems to be an exception. At this time though, we are quite literally at our breaking point. And now I'll let Carol Ann talk about some of the limits of the current system. Uh, not all of our journals are using the B-Press layout, which the journals that do use the B-Press layout are much easier journals to manage. Um, International Journal of Speleology, for instance, they wanted to be able to have the author submit their manuscript and their figures and then the B Press system to create a PDF file with all of the figures included in the manuscript file for the reviewers to have. Um, the B Press system at that t this time does not do that, although I believe that's been submitted as an enhancement for their system. So IJS has been working around this. What International Journal of Speleology is doing is the editor receives the PDF and the figures, and then they go into the, the manuscript and add all of the figures into it. It's actually submitted as a document file, and then they have to reload it into the system before it goes out to the reviewer. So there is a there has to be a manual intercession in the system for that to work. Um, the way that Studio Geologia is working around the same issue is that the, ed the new editor of that one is having his author submit a manuscript with lower quality figures in the manuscript as one document for the reviewers to get. Once the document is accepted for publications, then the authors have to go through the submission process again to add the supplementary files with the high resolution figures and tables that they want to have included in the article. So either way, it's kind of a two-step process. Um, we actually had one journal that wanted to have a Drupal system built, and we had, no, if you want to use our system, you're going to use the B-Press system, and this is what it's going to look like. So we have to kind of, you know, explain the realities of the system that we're using to our editors. This slide gives you some item counts by journal. You can see we've got a wide range of item counts for some of our our materials. Um, we've got a couple of onesie twosie things in here where they were items that they were titles that came into the repository as brand new titles um, and it had a hard time getting some content. Several of these titles actually had content available either on another website that was freely available or they had print copies that we were able to digitize and get into the repository. International Journal of Speleology was one of these. This is the one down on the bottom right-hand corner here with 220. That number was larger, but the quality of the PDFs that we had gotten from their previous website were in pretty bad shape. They were very difficult to read, so we've hidden those from view, and those have been removed from their item count. Um, you see that numeracy up here in the orange slice with 106 items, that was our born digital one, so they've actually had 106 items that they have published originally in the B-Press system. Um, and so this gives you an idea of the spread of our item count. This slide shows our uses by journal going back to 2007. So numeracy went live right at the end of December of 2007. This is actually the January 2008 issue. But he, the editor was very excited that he got to publish a week or so early before Christmas. So in their first month, they still had 61 hits. And then you can see how their, their usage has increased over time. It was actually in April of 2012 that they went into the digital common system from the etiquette system, and Studio Geologia moved from etiquette to digital commons in August or so of 2011. So both of them, right around those times, had a large increase in the usage of their, of their journals. 
towards the bottom of the slide, ABO went live in April of 2013 and has already had 2,200 hits. And UJMM, the Undergraduate Journal of Mathematics Modeling, had, went live in May, and that's had twice as many as ABO has had. I'll let Julie talk for a minute about our fun facts about some of our journals. <gasps> Hello. So the BPRESS system allows us to pull reports on usage, and we have some pretty impressive figures from the four journals that we've had the longest. The numbers here um, that are on your screen are from a report pulled back around May-ish. But glancing at some of the numbers this week, we've already seen some major increases. The Journal of Strategic Security is consistently one of our most downloaded journals. And it has one article that has been downloaded. Um, now it is um, almost 6,000 times, um, 5,987 for this particular article. Uh, when Studia UBB Geologia moved to our new platform, its downloads increased significantly, almost 90%. Numeracy, which is our first journal, um, now has just 106 items, and those have been downloaded 48,550 times. And the International Journal of Speleology is our only journal that currently has an impact factor. So who is involved? Well, obviously, Julie and I um, are involved in the repository. Most of the people on this screen, except for Todd Chavez, are in a capacity that we call a production editor. So a production editor on each of these journals, we're the point person for the editor to work with B-Press. Um, could be partly because of layouts, which Julie and Brenna are doing. Um, could be to handle minor technical issues, if they've got questions about the system and how it works and what they can do, or they have an idea of how they want their workflow to do, so we talk about how that will work in the B-Press system. So we try to field as many of those more minor things as we can so that B-Press doesn't get inundated. They've got other customers besides us to deal with, so um, we're able to handle a number of those things from this end. Rebel Cumming Sauls, she's doing a couple of uh, journals that she's handling as production editor, but she also is our main institutional repository person. She handles the repository as a whole with the, the batch loading and helping to get that special, co um, special collections content into the system and to get the faculty selected work. So she works with a larger group of faculty than most of us do. Alra is our um, Spanish language person, so she's handling Revista Sorpa Sur, and she's also our statistics person, so she got statistics and volcanology as one of her journals. Musa is our Holocaust and Genocide Studies librarian, so he's the one that's been working with our African folks to, to get some of their journals um, into the system. And Matt Knight is also in Special Collections and has worked with one or two journals to help um, get the editors um, involved in the system and, and make sure that they have what they need. And Todd Chavez is sort of the, the brainchild of all of this. He's the one who um, started the initiative for the open access journals, who has done a lot of the footwork with the faculty to publicize what we're doing, and he's negotiated most of the memorandums of understanding, although he's starting to delegate that to other people as he get pulled, he's getting pulled into other directions. So where we are now, we've got two more journals in the development phase. We actually just in the last week or so sent um, the design materials to B-Press. So B-Press is working on getting that material um, into a, a demo site for us so that we can start training the editors on their journals. We're still importing restructured special collections content. That's been an ongoing process. Um, a lot of information was imported after laying some groundwork to import over 30,000 items from Coral, which was the system I mentioned that was a combination of some open source products and, and some of our homegrown stuff. We have the National Cave and Karst Management Symposium material, and we've got GIS data sets and projects that are ongoing. Those projects, the, the data is not actually contained in Scholar Commons at USF, 
but the metadata in the repository is linking out to the data. So vPress is maximizing the search engine discoverability. So having that metadata in the repository is greatly increasing the usage of that data. One of the data sets that's going to be coming in is the CMH grant data from the Gulf oil spill. So I'm going to turn this to Todd and see if we have any questions from anyone that we might answer. We've got a little bit of time left, I think. The only question we received was from uh, Shannon Spencer, who asked, why do you want to stop publishing OA journals? Why do we want to stop, or why do we want to continue? Her question was, why do you want to stop? <laughs> so. We don't want to stop. We're planning on continuing this initi initiative, absolutely. Um, we're trying to minimize the number of new journals that are coming in simply because of staffing considerations, that we don't have the people to manage any more than what we're already doing. And that goes back to that managing your capacity and knowing what your limits are and setting boundaries. So we're trying to just be cognizant of that. But if we could get more people, we would take on more journals. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? If so, please type them into the Q&A box. Uh, Wendy Walker asks if you'd be willing to share your MOU. Um, yeah, actually, it's available on the Scholar Commons website. If you go in, let me see if I can find the link for that. I'm not sure that I can. See, I'm going to take that off a of full screen for a minute so I can access other things. Well, while you're looking at, for that, a, uh, we also have a question from um, Jennifer Baisley, who wants to know, have you had any requests to publish eBooks? We do have the open access textbooks, um, but we do not have, I don't know that we've got just regular eBooks. We've had a few people approach us about that, but I don't know that, that we've got anything new in the pipeline for that. My computer I, uh, seems to have frozen up. I found the link for the MOU. I'll post it here in the chat. OK. OK. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Barb Loomis. How did you get an impact factor for that one journal? That journal already had an impact factor when we took it on. So we did not actually go through the process of that. Okay, um, are there any more questions for Carol Ann and Julie? I'm not, uh, how about the DOIs? We um, registered with Crossref as a publisher, and so they assign a STEM DOI for us. And then for the journals, we build the DOI from there. There's a couple of different ways that, that we could do it. Um, we could use the B-Press manuscript number as part of the DOI. What we do is we take the ISSN for the journal and then the volume issue and article number um, as, and build the DOI that way. So when you look at the DOI, it actually has a pattern to it. So we just explain that to the new editors, that that's the pattern that they're to follow so they can actually assign their own DOIs as they're going through and, and putting their articles in order. And then we just grab those and put those into XML files to s submit that to Crossref. OK. Are there any more questions for Carol or Julie? Not seeing any. So I'd like to take this chance to thank Carol Ann and Julie very much for uh, presenting today. Uh, thank you all for your patience as we had technical difficulties. Uh, it's very appreciated. Um, again, whenever you log off today, you'll be redirected to a survey. Please fill that out and let us know how we did and give us some ideas of how we can improve our webinars and what sort of topics you might be uh, interested in us getting presenters on. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a good day and uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Good afternoon. And Julie and I appreciate the opportunity to present the webinar. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much.